welcome. We will move to questions without notice, and I give the call to the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Before the Prime Minister was elected, under a coalition government, a typical Australian family could secure a new variable rate home loan at 2.4 per cent, paying $35,000 a year. After two years of the Albanese government decisions driving up inflation, the new loan variable interest rate is 6.3 per cent, costing Australian families an extra $21,000 in after-tax dollars. Why won't the Prime Minister admit that his $315 billion spending spree is driving homegrown inflation and threatening further interest rate increases into the future? I give the call to the Prime Minister. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question, which goes to a comparison of where the Australian economy was in 2022 and where it is now. And I'm happy to uh, comment on that, Mr Speaker, because uh, in the March quarter of 2022, inflation went up by 2.1 per cent, the biggest quarterly rise this century. This century. And what we've done is reduce inflation from where Order. we inherited it. Uh, when it comes to wages, outside of the pandemic, the biggest drop in real wages this century also occurred in the March quarter of 2022, down 1.4 per cent. So think about this. Inflation record up in 2022, wages record down in March 2022. Now, real wages grew more in the past year at 0.5 per cent than they did during their entire 10 years in office. We inherited a sluggish labour market. Under us, 880,000 new jobs have been created. Productivity growth under them was the worst in 40 years, in 40 years, and we've reversed that decline. Business investment declined to the lowest level since the early 2000s under them. Business investment under us has grown in every single quarter, up 13 per cent in real terms. And of course the budget. Under them they planned a $78 billion deficit with no surpluses projected at any time between 2022 and 2060-61. That was their projections going forward. Well, we have turned that $78 billion deficit into a labour surplus of $22 billion and then a second labour surplus in the following year. But they also make this absurd claim about government spending, and they include in that things that I'd suggest, therefore, they must be opposed to. Indexation of the age pension. They're against that. Indexation of income support payments. The pay rise for aged care workers, well, they've been up front about opposing that. Uh, funding new medicines on the PBS, apparently they're against all of that. The natural disaster recovery funding and relief in the electorates of the member for Riverina and the member for Calair and the member for Page, the member for Richmond in all of these electorates, they're against that as well, apparently. Give the call to the honourable order. Give the call to the honourable member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Why is a future made in Australia so important? And what alternatives has the Albanese Labor government rejected? Call to the Treasurer. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the member for Jagger Jagger for her question and for representing the 77,000 people in her local community who get a tax cut this week because of this Prime Minister and this government. Mr. Speaker, I was proud to introduce the Future Made in Australia legislation earlier today. A Future Made in Australia is all about secure jobs and more opportunities and a new generation of prosperity in an economy powered Order. by cleaner and cheaper energy. It's all about maximising our geological, geographical, geopolitical and meteorological advantages. It's all about broadening and deepening our industrial base and becoming a renewable energy superpower. It's all about making ourselves an indispensable Order. part of the global net zero transformation, the biggest change 
in the global economy since the Industrial Revolution and ensuring that our people and our businesses are beneficiaries, not victims, of that change. And so the legislation we introduced today is all about imposing rigour and robustness and discipline on the public investment which is necessary to leverage the private capital that we will need and to ensure that investment benefits our workers and our local communities, Mr Speaker. So it's a very important day because a future made in Australia is absolutely central to this Prime Minister's vision for the future of our economy. And our economic plan is all about relief, repair and reform. Relief this week with substantial, meaningful and responsible cost of living help. Repair of the budget, which sees us turn two big Liberal deficits into Labor surpluses, and reform to modernise our economy and maximise our advantages, Mr Speaker. We cannot afford as a country to waste another decade of denial and delay, but that's what those opposite are proposing Barker, by going down the nuclear the path. They are choosing the most expensive, the most divisive, the least viable option that takes the longest and squanders Australia's unique combination of economic advantages. Their nuclear policy is equal parts ideological extremism and economic insanity, and so is their plan to rip up the emissions reduction targets. Both of those things together would blow up investor certainty in our economy, and that's why their angry incompetence sends a shiver up the spine of investors here and abroad, Mr Speaker. Our economic plan is mainstream and it is methodical. It is about certainty Order. and it is about clarity about the government's vision and our nation's ambitions for the future. And the bills that I was proud to introduce today with the Minister for Energy are an important part of that effort. Yeah. Give a call to the member for Hume. Yeah. My question is to the Prime Minister. After three failed budgets, the Prime Minister has failed to tackle and beat inflation. Respected economist Chris Richardson has said governments have abandoned the field in the inflation fight. We are fighting the, fighting the inflation fight one-handed and that mortgage relief is a very, very long way away. When will the Prime Minister admit his $315 billion spending spree is driving homegrown inflation and threatening further interest rate increases into the future? Yeah. Order. The Treasurer will just wait until before he stands before I call him. Order. The, the member for Hume, you've asked your question. You have the MPI today. You've had a lot of latitude this week, so we're just going to. Make sure everyone's following the rules, and the Prime Minister, uh, the Treasurer, has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Now, once again, Mr. Speaker, as the Prime Minister said a moment ago, Order. if the Shadow Treasurer Order. thinks Members there's 315 on, billion dollars too left. much spending in the budget, then he should come clean to the pensioners and veterans and people who rely on Medicare in this country and tell them exactly how he's going to cut 315 billion dollars of spending from the budget, Mr Speaker. And if he's angry about inflation, which is running in quarterly terms at 3.6 per cent, he must have been absolutely furious with the 6.1 per cent that he left us when he stopped being one of the most embarrassing parts of the worst performing government since Federation, Mr Speaker. Now, when inflation, when inflation had a six in front of it and was on the way up, uh, and when interest rates were already rising, they delivered a budget which had a net policy, policy spend of nearly $40 billion, which is nearly double what our budget did. They forecast two deficits, which we are turning into two Labor surpluses. In two years alone, a $165 billion turnaround in the budget. That is historic, Mr Speaker, $215 billion in total. We've banked the majority, the vast majority of revenue upgrades they used to spend most of it. We found almost $80 billion in savings in the budget. Their last budget zero. had precisely zero dollars in savings, Mr Herbert Speaker. And so the point I'm making here, Mr Speaker, with this avalanche of damning facts about their record in office is they wouldn't know the first thing about responsible economic management. The Shadow Treasurer wouldn't know responsible economic management if it slapped him in the face. Mr Speaker, and their record, their record speaks for itself. As the Prime Minister Member pointed Deacon. out rightly a moment ago, when we came to office there were deficits as far as the eye can see. 
There was a trillion dollars in Liberal Party debt and almost nothing to show for it, and the budget was being consumed by the interest costs on that debt. And so we have been working in a considered and a methodical and a responsible way to clean up the mess that we inherited from those opposite. We've seen inflation moderate substantially since they were office, but not enough. Mr. Speaker, it needs to moderate Order, further member, and faster. Fisher and we know and from the comments from the Reserve Bank ejecting. Governor and the Reserve Bank Deputy Governor that the sorts of things that we are doing are helping in the fight against inflation. Primarily turning your two big Liberal deficits into two the Labor the surpluses, Hume. the Governor of the Reserve Bank has said that is helpful in the fight against inflation. And the last point that I would make, Mr. Speaker, but I hope I get many more questions about this is if those opposite really cared about the cost of living pressures that people are under, they wouldn't be opposing the cost of living ro relief which is rolling out this week. Yeah. The call to the member for Cunningham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industry and Science. How is the Albanese Labor government delivering more secure jobs and investing in our manufacturers through the future Made in Australia plan? What policies has the government ruled out and why? The call to the Minister for Industry and Science. Right, I thank the member for their question and note that 72,000 taxpayers in the electorate of Cunningham better off from this Order. week's tax cuts. The now, Speaker, stronger, strong economies possess strong manufacturing capabilities, and our future made in Australia plans are about mobilising Australian manufacturing to make the things that reduce emissions and create strong, secure jobs in the process, delivering sovereign capability, allowing us to stand on our own two feet, reducing our dependency on concentrated supply chains, building economic resilience. Jobs up, emissions down, stronger economy. That's what our Future Made in Australia legislation is all about. And we've got this once-in-a-generation opportunity to leverage off our deep reserves of critical minerals and resources, We've got a constant sun supply of sun and wind that bless our continent and an army of skilled Australian workers who can get the job Order. done to take Order. our economy Casey. forward. And the Future Made in Australia legislation introduced today by the Treasurer is about locking in our advantages and investing in our strengths and, importantly, doing so without pushing up energy prices for manufacturers with risky, expensive nuclear reactors. And, Speaker, you could fit their nuclear plans on a post-it note with space left over. They've got key details missing, like how much will it actually cost? Order. How much more Order. will manufacturers Remember and households page. pay for their power supply? An idea so staggeringly uninvestable, Order. they didn't even Members commit left to work rejecting. with the private sector to finance their power plants. And breathtakingly, we've got a leader of the opposition trying to dress this sham up as some sort of help for Australian manufacturing. Because remember, the Liberal and National parties only ever talk about manufacturing to talk it down. In government, they chased out our car manufacturers. They oversaw the destruction of 100,000 manufacturing jobs. In opposition, wouldn't vote for the National Reconstruction Fund. They wouldn't back energy price relief for manufacturers, and they wanted to call an early election to stop tax cuts for manufacturing workers. And now, desperate to sell this start of a policy, you hear in the distance the deputy leader of the opposition say, "Just tell them it's good for manufacturing." I mean, the political mouse just blows my mind, Speaker. <laughs> Only talking about manufacturing now, friends, because it's in their political interest. Not because it's in national interest, it's in their political interest and they chase away manufacturers. Australian manufacturing Order. workers deserve better and our future Made in Australia plan will deliver better. Before I call the member for Clark, I'll just do some brief acknowledgements. I'm pleased to inform the House today in the gallery is a delega delegation of participants from the Leadership Illawarra, Illawarra program and the member for Cunningham's electorate, and Paul and Kamala Signori from the Biagio Signori Foundation and Kim Brislin from the Asbestos and Dust Diseases Research Institute as guests of the member for Reid. Welcome to you all. And I give the call to the honourable member for Clark. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Housing and Homelessness. Minister, despite all the federal government talk about doubling housing and homelessness funding, 
Funding for Tasmania will in fact decline this year under the National Agreement on Social Housing and Homelessness from $38.1 million to $37.4 million. This is the biggest proportional decline of any state. Minister, I'm sure you understand the dire housing situation in Tasmania as well as I do. How on earth could you let this happen? I call to the Minister for Housing, the Minister for Homelessness and the Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I uh, thank the member for Clark for his question. I understand where he's coming from uh, with this question and his concern for the, uh, the people of Tasmania who are struggling with housing challenges. Order. And indeed, I share his concern in terms of uh, what is happening in Tasmania with housing. But I want to reassure the member for Clark that um, the inference of his question is actually not true. No state or territory is going backwards in funding under the new agreement. None. And that is not including all of the additional money as well that we are having as part of our $32 billion Homes for Australia plan. As I say to the member, I have been working very closely with the Tasmanian state government. And indeed, since the election, our election, we have provided now more than $145 million to Tasmania uh, since we came to office for homelessness services and to build more homes. And under Housing Australia, with the Housing Accord and the Housing Australia Future Fund, Tasmania, as one of the smaller jurisdictions, will be getting at least 1,200 homes on top of that funding. So Tasmania will be getting our fair share, let me assure you of that, as will other states and territories. Um, I actually had the opportunity just a few weeks ago to go and announce 15 new social homes with the Tasmanian Minister Felix Ellis in Berrydale and the members' electorate. And standing next to me, the Tasmanian Liberal Minister Felix Ellis said, and I quote, the federal government has provided significant new funds, end quote. Uh, these homes are, of course, Order. being supported by the $50 the, the million dollars the, the, that we provided the, minister, the Tasmanian government pause. through the social housing... The minister will pause. The member for Clark on a point of order. <laughs> uh, speaker, point of order. Regarding the national agreement on social housing and homelessness, the minister is attempting to mislead the parliament. No, Member for Clark. You're unable to, under the standing orders and practice, to even suggest that. So, to assist the House with a long line of precedents, I'm going to ask the Member for Clark to withdraw. Speaker, I withdraw. Minister in continuation. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Member for Clark. I will reiterate, no state or territory will be receiving any less under the new housing agreement. Let me be very clear about that. I'm happy to have a meeting with the Member for Clark and go through the figures and to clear this up with him. I'm also happy to advise the Member for Clark that 25,000 Tasmanians will be benefiting from an increase in the Commonwealth rent assistance, uh, the first back-to-back -back increase in more than 30 years. That will be supporting many Tasmanians. And since the uh, last election, the Albanese Labor government has also supported now 1,500 Tasmanians into home ownership through our expanded and improved home guarantee scheme. And of course, we want to do more with help to buy the shared equity scheme. And I'll continue to work with the Tasmanian government to deliver more homes for Tasmanians that need them. I give a call to the member for Swan. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. What does the introduction of the Albanese Labor government's future made in Australia legislation mean for jobs, industries and opportunities for tomorrow? What alternative policies have been rejected? I give the call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Well, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Swan for her question. The member for Swan, as an engineer born and raised in Kalgoorlie, knows Australia's opportunity to be a renewable energy superpower. She dedicated her professional life to solutions to decarbonise Australia and the world, Mr. Speaker, and she's continuing that in this House. Now, Mr. Speaker, there's an energy transformation underway right around the world, and Australian energy can power it. Australian regions can drive it. Australian resources can build it. Australian entrepreneurs and researchers can design it, and Australian workers can thrive from it, Mr. Speaker, but only with the right policy settings. And the right policy settings are the ones that the Order. Treasurer and I introduced into the Parliament today. They've been worked on by the Minister for Industry, the Minister for Resources and the entire Cabinet to seize the opportunities for our country. Now, Mr Speaker, these opportunities are enormous. Our investment in green hydrogen, for example, is uh, designed to unlock 
$50 billion worth of private sector investment by unleashing and unlocking that private sector investment and to create jobs. And the legislation we introduced today outlines the rigorous process, the national interest test, and also uh, provides funding and statutorily protected funding for ARENA, ARENA, which the previous government tried to abolish on so many occasions and tried to defund while locking in that funding. Now, the honourable member asked me what uh, policies we reject in, in, instead of the policies that we are implementing. Now, of course, those opposite propose a policy which promises jobs decades away, which is a unicorn, Mr. Speaker. Take some examples. Take some examples, because what our policy is designed to do is to Order. stop Australian ingenuity and Australian expertise being exported to jobs offshore. Australia invented the modern solar panel. We invented the flow battery. Uh, Australians have invented the most efficient solar panel in the world through SunDrive. Now they had to decide, Mr. Speaker, whether to manufacture in Australia or the United States. After the release of our policy, Solar Sunshot and Future Made in Australia, they have decided to manufacture in Australia. You know where? You know where? On the site of the old Liddell power station, and they will employ more Australians there than the power station ever did. Than the power station ever did. But those plans are threatened because somebody else wants to build a nuclear power station there some years into the future. So the people of the Hunter have a choice. Real jobs, real jobs now. Real jobs now are making Australian solar panels or fake fantasy jobs in decades into the future making nuclear energy. Both can't be true. Either we make solar panels at Liddell now or the opposition gets its way and the site is quarantined for a, for a nuclear plant decades in the future. That's why this through the opposition presents a real risk to the Australian economy and a real Minister's risk to Australian time jobs. Has concluded. Give the call to the member for Deakin. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why won't the Prime Minister admit that his decision to let in a record 547,000 migrants last year has been a significant reason for his homegrown housing crisis? Order. The Assistant Treasurer will cease interjecting. The Prime Order. The Prime Minister is going to be heard in silence. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Deakin for his question. And of course, the figures that he referred to is what's occurred under the system that we inherited. The system that we, a system that we inherited, Order. And, and, Order. A system, and a system that we are the fixing. Home Affairs, the a system Deakin that we are fixing because uh, what the three reviews that have been undertaken into our migration system have shown is that the migration system Order. that we inherited was broken. It was a mess. You had people coming in allegedly to do uh, study uh, that were not actually doing any training. They were just ticking that box off. And then they were, and then they were continuing to work here and engage here. Number now, right. the figures as well, it must be made this point, that the projections that were there under the former government were for a higher population than we have in Australia now. And when it Minister comes to the, housing, the for the that I'm also asked about, what we know is that we inherited a system where, where they Member, simply, Member for they simply asked his question. wasn't. They've never seen a social housing project that they supported, and that's one thing. Member with their Broome. opposition to the Housing Australia Future Fund. But they've also opposed, just during this sitting fortnight, the build to rent tax incentives, along with the Greens. And the justification for opposing this is that developers build housing. That's the justification. So they're against public housing and they're against private rentals. But in opposing the help to buy scheme, they're also against Home ownership. Prime Minister will order. Ask the, Prime the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme will cease ejecting. So will the Minister for Home Affairs. So I can hear the member for Deakin on the point of order. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The point of order is, again is on relevance. It can't be relevant to the question for the Prime Minister to critique the opposition, opposition given it was his ministers boasting oh, about the number of visas. 
The question was about the Prime Minister's decision regarding a, a migration number, and was that a reason for to deal with the housing crisis? Now, the Prime Minister is obviously not agreeing with that proposition put forward, so he's outlining his reasons why that is the case, and he'll just need to make sure his comments are directly relevant to the question. He can't stray into other areas of policy topics because it was specific around housing. So I'll just ask the Prime Minister to return to the question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm certainly talking about housing uh, because uh, we want more social homes. Yes. That was deferred oh, by order. those the opposite. We want more private rentals. That's currently blocked over in the Senate. And we want more home ownership. And that's still being blocked by those opposite as well. So I'm not sure what form of housing they want, because they don't want public housing, they don't want private rentals, and they don't want home ownership. All three have they opposed. But I'm interested, I'm interested to note, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, that the Queensland LNP have come out with an election policy. You know what it is? Shared equity. Shared equity. David Christopher has come out with a policy saying that he will have a shared equity scheme if he's elected in Order. Queensland. Prime Minister's Here they're against time it, has up there they're for it. Give the call to the Chief Government Whip. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How will the Albanese Labor government's future made in Australia plan create jobs and opportunities in every part of our country? And what opposition is there to making more things here? Give the call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Lawler for her question. I note that 95,000 of her constituents got a tax cut this week. 95,000. As well as, of course, many tens of thousands got a wage increase. Every single household got $300 energy bill relief. And I visited a chemist. Uh, in the electorate of Lawler just a couple of weeks ago uh, with the member. And uh, there, of course, uh, the pharmacists were talking about the real benefit, as well as constituents, uh, that our Chief of Medicine's policy has had. So we're dealing with the immediate, but we're also setting Australia up for the future. And that's what the Future Made in Australia Order. Act is all about. The next step in building Order a more prosperous future for every Australian, making more things here in Australia, making our economy more resilient, creating secure, well-paid jobs for Australians and making sure that workers and communities benefit from those jobs. And that is what our Future Made in Australia Act that was introduced today is all about, engaging and investing, not Order retreating and protecting, attracting private investment not replacing it, aligning our national security and our economic security interests. Now, the national interest framework that is at the heart of this legislation also uh, speaks about identifying sectors where we have a comparative advantage yeah, yeah. in the world economy. In areas like green hydrogen, we have a comparative advantage uh, going forward. And indeed, Indeed, as well as the world moves to a net zero economy, Order. there is nowhere Order. you'd rather be than Australia. But it will also examine the national interest on the basis of economic resilience, but also our national security. Public investment will be an important part of the plan, but the most important role for public investment will be to unlock private sector investment, because we on this side of the House haven't abandoned the private sector. We on this side of the House understand the importance of backing business. Now, Order. our public Minister investment will show us the path to a future made Deputy in Australia, but private capital is essential. And that's why our future made in Australia agenda is an investment strategy and it's a growth strategy to provide investors with the clarity and certainty that they need going forward so they can invest in Australia's future and take the Australian population with, with them to deliver good, secure, well-paid jobs. Before I call the member for Cowper, I'm pleased to inform the House that joined us 
On the floor of the parliament today is a parliamentary delegation from the Republic of Vanuatu, led by the Speaker, the Honourable Simeon Seule. On behalf of all members, we welcome you to question time today. Give the call to the Honourable Member for Kalpa. My question is to the Prime Minister. AMP's Deputy Chief Economist Diana Messina has said the high pace of immigration is not compatible with the level of housing supply that we have in this country. We're just not building enough homes to keep up with our population growth. Why won't the Prime Minister admit that his decision to let in a record 547,000 migrants last year has been a significant reason for his homegrown housing crisis? Call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Cowper for his question. He speaks about uh, migration during the period in which we've been in office, and I suggest he should join those who stand up in the coalition party room and question the leadership of this place. Right. Because, uh, because on, uh, Minister for the Home leader Affairs. of the opposition Minister had this to Affairs say in September 2022. We do need an increase in the migration numbers. It's clear the number needs to be higher. He went on to say later that year, just in case that you, um, that you think that was a one-off, uh, in addition to a domestic workforce, of course we need migration. We need migration. In his first budget reply, the Leader of the Opposition boasted, I brought in record numbers of people. That's what he had to say in his first budget reply. Well, what we've done is we're cutting the numbers. Order. We're cutting the numbers in half. We are cutting the numbers in half. That's just a fact. And, and, and we know that uh, Dr. Martin the Parkinson, who served under rejecting. those opposite as the head of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, had this to say after his review. This is a 10-year rebuild. This is not something you do quickly because it is so badly broken. It was a deliberate decision to neglect the system. Uh, Christine Nixon, who did an examination as well, said, I was surprised at the breadth, the sort of various areas where visas was used to then exploit people or for people to exploit the system. And of course, Dennis Richardson said, a lack of proper due diligence resulted in public money being handed to individuals and businesses suspected of seeking to circumvent US sanctions against Iran, money laundering, bribery, drugs and arms smuggling Order. into Australia and corruption. The member for the Prime Minister will pause and I will hear from the member for one on a point of order. Just relevant, Speaker. Uh, it's about the 547,000 visas seat. that were... There's no point of order. If you ask a question regarding uh, immigration numbers, and then the impact that that has on the housing crisis, which the way the question was framed. The Prime Minister, with the respect to the member regarding direct relevance, if the Prime Minister is reading quotes not about immigration or not reading about the impacts, that would not be relevant. So he, I'm listening carefully. He's reading, he's contesting the figures that were um, in the question, which he's entitled to do under the standing orders. He's just got to make sure his quotes and his references are regarding the topic, particularly on the numbers that he was asked about. And at this point, he's doing that, so he is being directly relevant. And he has one minute to go for the remainder of his answer, and he has the call. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what we've done is we've restored the immigration compliance function that was cut by the leader of the opposition by nearly 50%. We have increased the temporary skilled migration income threshold up to $70,000. We have ended the pandemic event visa, something that they left in place. We have cracked down on rorts in international education. We have implemented a $160 million reform package. We have imposed no with. further stay conditions on visitor visas. We have ended, we're ending migration system settings that drove temporary visa holders to stay long term, and we're introducing limits on international student numbers. We're taking action, as opposed to the mess that we inherited from those opposite. Order. Give the call to the honourable member for order. Order. I do not want any interjections. 
during this question being asked. Anyone who do so, does so will leave the chamber immediately. Member Werriwa has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Why is a considered and methodical approach to our economic challenges so important? What approaches to the economy has the Albanese Labor government ruled out? Here, here. Call to the Treasurer. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Big thanks to the member for Werriwa for her hard work on behalf of her constituents, particularly the 80,000 of them who will be receiving a tax cut this week from this Prime Minister and this government. Mr. Speaker, in the last week alone, uh, we are rolling out cost of living help for every taxpayer and every household. Uh, we are introducing, we have introduced the Future Made in Australia legislation uh, earlier today, and we got confirmation on Friday that we are on track for a second surplus, the first time there have been back-to-back -back surpluses in our budgets for almost two decades, Mr. Speaker. And this is the fruits of responsible economic policy made in a considered and a methodical and a consultative way, Mr Speaker. It's all about understanding the challenges and chances in our economy and managing them and modernising our economy and maximising our advantages so that our people benefit, Mr Speaker. And that's because we understand that you ease cost of living pressures with tax cuts and energy bill relief, not with expensive nuclear reactors which will push up energy prices. We understand that the best way to invest in the future is with clarity and ambition, not with the kind of extreme ideology that creates investor uncertainty, which is what we hear from those opposite, Mr Speaker. Now, the shambolic announcement that we heard yesterday makes this contrast between this side of the House and that side of the House even clearer. Their announcement on divestiture has exactly the same shambolic features as the nuclear announcement, the tax announcement and the migration announcement. Every announcement that they make is a new bin fire of angry incompetence which puts the future of our economy at risk. Every new announcement the that they Leader make the is the worst rejected. combination of uncosted and unhinged and undercooked, Mr Speaker. The primary purpose of each new announcement seems to be to distract from the announcement that they made <laughs> a few weeks ago. And let me give you a sense of that, Mr Speaker. Even a cursory look at the headlines, Mr Speaker gives you a sense of the shambles of those opposite. Shadow Treasurer rules out subsidies for nuclear power before they announced 100 per cent subsidies. Shadow Treasurer further confuses coalition's migration message. Shadow Treasurer changes script on Dutton's immigration cuts. Shadow Treasurer at odds with Leader on migration targets in shambolic post-budget appearance. Leader of the Opposition vetoes Nats Green's supermarket breakup plan just before he announced it. <laughs> Liberal Order. split on big retailers' breakup, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition's supermarket push leaves some colleagues feeling ambushed, Mr. Speaker. Peter Dutton says tax cut plan too costly. That's the tax cut plan that the Shadow Treasurer has announced, Mr. Speaker. But my favourite of all of them, Mr. Speaker, is this headline. He is not incompetent, Dutton backs Taylor, Mr Speaker. Responsible economic management versus the shambles of those opposite. Give the call to order. Give the call to the Honourable the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. My question is to the Prime Minister. Have Labor Senator Fatima Payman's claims of being intimidated by members of the Labor Party been referred to the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service? the call to the Prime Minister. I note, uh, I no thank the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for her question. It comes straight after the Leader of the Opposition last week was criticising us for the fact that we had taken a great deal of care uh, to give consideration the to Senator Payman. Uh, Senator Payman. Senator Payman, of course, uh, has uh, made a decision. Uh, to place herself uh, outside uh, the Labor Party. That's a decision that she made. I, I, I expect further announcements in coming days, which will uh, explain exactly what uh, the strategy has been over now more than a month. Order. The member for Hume has had a really good go on Monday, Tuesday and today. He is in charge of the MPI today, so the MPI is in his hands. So 
we won't be having any more interjections, or if we do have interjections from the member for Hume, we won't be having an MPI today. I hope that is crystal clear. Great. Give the order. Here to help. Give the call. Give a call to the member for Hasluck. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. What actions is the Albanese Labor government taking to make sure that Australians are getting better prices at the supermarket? And what approaches has the government rejected because they would lead to higher prices? Give the call to the Prime Minister. I thank the member for Hasluck for her question. And indeed, we know that too many families are feeling the pinch at the supermarket checkout. And that's why we've made sure that we want to look after farmers, but we also want to look after customers. Look after customers. And that's why, Order. That's why we're making Order. the Food and Grocery Code Order. of Conduct mandatory, something that never happened from those opposite. Order. The order. No. Pretty clear in my remarks about 30 seconds before. Everyone's going to get the memo now. Everyone is now on a general warning, and I'm looking at the member for Barker as well. So everyone is now on a warning. The leader of the Australian Greens on a point of order. I thought that was had moved on to the next question. No. No, that's fine. The Prime Minister in continuation. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Now uh, we're making what they had as voluntary mandatory. And that will mean that businesses will face fines of up to $10 million if they break the code, the heaviest fines of any industry code. We're partners with Choice to give households better information about prices. We've banned unfair contract terms and directed the ACCC to conduct an inquiry. All of these actions designed to bring prices down. Now, one thing that all of the experts agree on to push up prices would be divestiture. A policy that's supported by the Greens, the Nationals before, and now supported by the Liberals as well. One in which two days after the big announcement, we're yet to get a question from those opposite. So we've got to organise our own questions about their policies, Mr Speaker. But I, I'm glad that we're obliged by the member for Hasluck. Uh, because this isn't so much a policy as an unexpected item in the baggage area. That's what this is, Mr Speaker. As the independent review states... Hold on. Hold on. The, the Prime Minister will, will pause. Order, members. The Minister for Education is not helping the situation. The member for Page on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. The point of order is relevant. We always have in questions you allow contrast, compare and contrast in an answer, but every single answer the government has given today Resume has been sledged in the opposition. Yeah. Oh. Yep. Yes. The member for Page has raised a point of order, but the question cannot just simply be about the opposition's policy. So the question was about the actions the government's taking, and what has the government to ensure that outcome that he was asked about, the Prime Minister was asked about, and then what has the government rejected? So we're about halfway through the answer. So it's about a 50. Yes. So the Prime Minister is obviously outlining what the government is rejecting. But he can't have his whole answer about it, and he hasn't done that so far. So he's being directly relevant. He has the call. Don't worry, Hugs, I'll bring it home. <laughs> um, the fact is that the independent review that we undertook said the result could easily be greater market concentration, less competition. Right. Oh, please, See. Order. The member for Wannan on a point of order. Can the Prime Minister has to refer to members by the correct <laughs> Okay. The Prime Minister will refer to members by their correct titles. Sure will. 
If I knew what his portfolio was, I'd say. <laughs> um, the Leader of the Opposition started the year telling people to boycott Woolies. Remember that? Now he wants to nationalise it, Mr Speaker. Uh, order. The member for Page, and this better be a decent point of order, because we're point disrupting. Of order. Point of order on hubris, no, resume Speaker, your... because it... Re resume. No, no. Resume your seat, and you may leave the chamber on as well. The Prime Minister in continuation. Mr Speaker, it's been quite a journey for the Liberal Party. Menzies tried to ban the Communist Party. They want to adopt the Communist Party model. They want publicly owned energy through nuclear energy, and now they want, one would assume, publicly owned supermarkets. Because if Coles has to sell, guess who will buy it? Maybe Woolworths. Just maybe. Nuclear reactors that drive up power prices and a supermarket schmozzle that will drive up grocery prices. These are their big ideas they have, those opposite, but Australians will be left with the bill. With the call to the Leader of the Australian Greens. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Your Labor government has over 1,300 autonomous sanctions on Russia because of their violation of international law. Yet even with the UN confirming the Israeli government has committed war crimes in Palestine, you failed to impose any sanctions at all. Will you impose any sanctions on the government of Israel? Why have you put more sanctions on a senator for speaking out about Palestine than on the extremist Netanyahu government for invading Palestine? Members on my right will cease interjecting. The member for Spence will leave the chamber under 94A. The Prime Minister has the call. I thank the member for Melbourne for his question. I inform him that 101,000 of his constituents got a tax cut this week. 101,000 of them. And I'm asked, I'm asked about uh, the political party that I belong to and I've been loyal to my whole life and people that making a decision to a distance themselves from their former party, and he's full of people in that cross section who used to be members of the National Party or members of the Liberal Party. And Senator Thorpe, of course, was elected uh, earlier uh, in the last election as a member of the Greens political party and chose uh, to depart from that. From time to time, Order, from time to time, uh, that happens, and that uh, that has happened in terms of. Uh, the senator uh, making a decision uh, that uh, she uh, wished to uh, be able to take an, an independent position when it comes to the Order. Middle East. I'm asked about uh, also. Order. The Leader of the Opposition and members on my left will cease interjecting. I'm also asked about uh, events in the Middle East and our position, and our position has been very consistent. Our position has been consistent with the motion that was moved by Senator Wong in the Senate, and one in which people need to explain why it is that they objected to such a motion. It was the need for the Senate to recognise the state of Palestine as a part of a peace process in support of a two-state solution and a just and enduring peace. That's the position of those of us on this side of the House. That those in the Greens political party in the Senate and the coalition voted against. I don't understand what is objectionable about that. The key to, the key to what needs to happen in the Middle East is that there needs to be support for President Biden's peace plan. There needs to be a ceasefire and an end to uh, what has occurred in Gaza. There needs to be, therefore, a release of uh, hostages. There needs to be increased humanitarian support for the people of Gaza. And there needs to be a lasting and enduring peace that means the people of Palestine and Israel living side by side in peace and security. That is our position. 
that is something that we work towards. It won't be achieved by uh, resolutions in the Senate and stunts by the Greens. It won't be achieved. It won't be achieved by those people who choose to desecrate, desecrate war memorials. The member, the member for Morton will leave the chamber under 94A. There is a general warning in the House that applies literally to everyone in the House. The Leader of the Australian Greens on the point, point of order on relevance. Every part of that question referred to sanctions on the Israeli government. And there's 10 seconds left, and the Prime Minister might choose to respond to that. The Prime Minister has 10 seconds to conclude his answer. We have taken a principled position on these issues. We will continue to do so and will continue to support social inclusion and trying to turn down the heat in this country Order. because Prime overwhelmingly that is what the Australian population concluded. wants. We have a call to the member for Reid. My question is to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. How is the Albanese Labor government working collaboratively with investors and the private sector to deliver for Australians? What policies have been rejected? The call to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy. Well, I thank my honourable friend for the question, Mr. Speaker. And as the member for Reid knows, providing a welcoming and stable policy environment for investment, particularly in renewable energy, has been the centrepiece of our policies since we came to office. From the Climate Change Act, the passage of the Climate Change Act, legislating our targets to provide that certainty through the Capacity Investment Scheme, through to the future made in Australia that we introduced today. It is all about attracting investment, creating jobs and reducing prices, Mr Speaker. And that's why we've been able to see an increase in renewable energy in our grid by 25 per cent. That's why the Minister for the Environment has been able to approve more renewable applications than the Abbott and Turnbull governments combined, enough to power two million homes. That's why we've seen 8.5 gigawatts of new renewable energy in our system. And it's why the Capacity Investment Scheme auction, which uh, closed last week for six gigawatts, had a massive 40 gigawatts worth of bids for it, Mr Speaker, which shows the pipeline of projects that are ready to go with the right policy environment, reducing prices and creating jobs. And the honourable member asked me what policies we reject. Well, we reject policies to rip up contracts and break up companies, Mr Speaker. That's what the alternative economic policy of this country is, to rip up existing contracts and to break up companies. The leader of the National Party said he was going to cancel all the offshore wind zones, and then he was asked, well, are you going to cancel Gippsland? And he said, oh, no, because that's smaller than the Illawarra zone. It's 15 times bigger, actually, but that's the level of analysis we get from the leader of the National Party. Now, uh, the Leader of the National Party, Mr Speaker, the one thing that combines these two policies to rip up contracts for renewable energy and break up companies is that they were designed by the National Party. And I, I want to give credit where it's due. I mean, the current Leader of the National Party, the current Leader of the National Party's ideas are just as dangerous as the member for New England's. It's just much more effective at getting them implemented than the member for New England was, Mr Speaker. He's actually writing the policies of the alternative government. The once great Liberal Party of Australia has vacated the field for the National Party. And when you hear the National Party's right of economic policy, you should be very worried. The only thing that should worry you more is when that policy has been written by a coalition of the Greens and the National Party together, <laughs> Mr Speaker. Putting the National Party in charge of economic policy is like putting the member for Hume in charge of a Facebook page. There's lots of things that can go wrong, Mr Speaker. There's lots of things that can go wrong. And we've seen the shadow, we've seen the shadow treasurer rolled more often than a pair of dice, Mr Speaker, at a, at a games party. He's completely abrogated the field. He's completely abrogated the field of good economic policy. And what the leader of the National Party is doing, Order. to his credit, I always like to give credit where it's due, as a post-partisan figure at the dispatch box, Mr. Speaker. I like to give credit where it's due. The leader of the National Party smells weakness in the leader of the opposition. He smells policy weakness. He sees a vacuum and he wants to fill it. Well, that means a big risk for Australian business. It means a big risk for Australian investment, and it means a big risk for Australian jobs from the little proud Dutton government. The call to the honourable the minister for industry and science, Member Groom, has the call. Speaker, my question is to the prime minister. The coalition is standing up for small businesses, farmers and consumers by ensuring stronger penalties for anti-competitive behaviour in our supermarket sector, including divestiture powers for our worst misconduct. 
Prime Minister, these actions are in line with comments made earlier this year by the chair of the ACCC, Gina Cascott-Lieb, who said divestiture powers would be useful to have in the toolkit. When will the Prime Minister show leadership and join the coalition in supporting a fairer deal for families and farmers at the checkout? Yeah. Good call to the Prime Minister. Thanks very much. I thank the member for Groom very much for the opportunity to have a second crack at this, uh, at, at this issue, Mr Speaker. And there are 70,000 of the member for Groom's constituents will benefit from a tax cut this, this, this Monday, this Monday as a result. And I hope that the member for Groom has told them that they oppose it, and I hope as well that he goes out there and spruiks this divestiture policy uh, that was not so much announced but slipped out by the Leader of the Opposition uh, yesterday uh, in uh, in a way in which there was then absolutely no fault. He did a stand up, he did, before question time, then came in here and didn't ask a single question about it, and nor has he today. But the member for Order. Groom the member for Groom will never say no to an opportunity. Order. The fact is the fact is that this is a model that will lead to higher prices. I'm not sure who they think will buy a Woolworths or a Coles if they're forced to sell in a local community except each other except each other and that is why it is such an impractical plan i said before mr speaker uh, that it has been quite a journey for the liberal party of menzies to go from trying to ban the communist party to trying to implement implement state ownership of both supermarkets and also our energy sector, uh, you can imagine, you can imagine, Mr. Speaker, uh, how they'll go during the election campaign. Seize the means of production, they'll be out there saying, Mr. Speaker. Seize the means of electricity. Production. When it comes to energy, socialism in our half lifetime. When it comes to nuclear reactors, Mr. Speaker, that will be the slogan that they have. At the next election, it won't be so much a three-year plan; it'll be a five-year plan, uh, because the National Party have completely taken over the agenda over there, as as the Minister for Order. Energy Members has said. Right. There is no credible, no credible argument for this policy. It began as a policy from the Greens political party on economic policy. They were in government for a decade and never did it. They wouldn't even mandate the voluntary code of conduct, so they've gone from having a voluntary code Order. written Members on my by right. the supermarkets themselves into potentially nationalising those supermarkets in just two years. And in between time, the seamless segue that occurred prior to Australia Order. Day of the Leader of the Opposition wanting Woolies boycotted over what thongs they sold. The call to the honourable member for Bendigo. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories. Why are regional communities better off under an Albanese Labor government? Yeah. Give the call to the order. Give the call to the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for her question and note. Under our policy, 66,000 taxpayers in her electorate got a tax cut this week. As a regional member of this place, I have made it my priority to meet hundreds of community members outside of our big cities over the last few years, and I know what it's like for people on the ground out there. That's why, Mr Speaker, I'm incredibly proud to be part of a Labor government that takes real action to improve the lives of regional people. This week, every taxpayer in our regions got a tax cut, and millions of Australians also got a pay rise. That's how you deliver cost of living relief, not by pushing up power prices with expensive nuclear reactors. And on this side of the House, Mr Speaker, we know that power prices are a serious issue for regional Australians, and that's why we acted by taking $300 off power bills now compared to those across the aisle there who will take two decades uh, to implement the most expensive form of energy there is. After a wasted decade of inaction and colour-coded spreadsheets, those have come to opposition the minister, promising the, minister, the, minister the world. Will pause, the minister will pause. The member for Cowper will leave the chamber under 94A. There is a general warning. 
and interjecting continually during an answer is an easy way to ensure that's enforced. Minister in continuation. Thank you, Mr Speaker. They came here promising the world in opposition because, as the Prime Minister just said, they did nothing when they had the opportunity to mandate a code of conduct for the supermarkets. And now we're talking about divestiture powers, which in regional Australia basically means your one option might become no options. Real smart. Real smart. The Minister will pause. I want to hear from the, I want to hear from the manager of opposition business. Well, Mr Speaker, on relevance, the question was, in fact, commendably tightly drafted. Why are regional communities better off under an Albanese Labor government? It, based on a ludicrous premise, but nevertheless, it was tightly drafted. There is no scope for the minister to be doing as she's doing, trawling through uh, a series of unsubstantiated allegations about the opposition. Yeah. Yeah. The minister, the minister is on a long bow here, and in. in talking about opposition policy or government's record. She wasn't former government's record. She wasn't asked about that. She needs to include where she believes the regional communities are better off, not simply why you believe they're better off. You need to explain that to the House. And she has the call. Absolutely, Mr Speaker. And they're better off with an Albanese Labor government than they ever were under those opposite. But we won't stop at tax cuts, Mr Speaker. We have implemented and today introduced the Future Made in Australia Bill, a bill that is $22.7 billion injection of funds to make sure that we can make more things in this country and be at the forefront of an energy evolution happening across the world. Because letting this opportunity go past and the economic growth that comes with it if we let that pass by us, it would be a real kick in the teeth to regional Australia, but we are not going to do that, Mr Speaker. This fund will be an absolute game changer, the biggest manufacturing package ever seen in Australia's history. Yeah. We are not prepared to tell car manufacturers to go offshore. We are going to make sure manufacturers set up onshore. We want to make sure that there is an unprecedented level of funding bringing Mem skilled jobs into our regions to boost local economies. And while we're talking to regional communities about the benefits of an energy evolution, about the manufacturing jobs that come from it, those opposite are talking to themselves. We are supporting people to stay local, to train local, because we don't want people to have to pack their bags to get an opportunity in a big city. We want them to build a career in regional Australia. We are making our economy more resilient, creating jobs and a better future for regional and rural Australia. That's how you deliver growth for regional communities. We don't want another decade to tick by, uh, because under those Minister's opposite, it was delays and excuses. Under us, included. it's at. Call to the member for Mayo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Financial Services. Not-for-profits with an ABN are required to lodge annual self-review returns to the ATO. Many organisations are run by retired volunteers who tell me it's an overwhelming process involving a MyGov ID, online lodgement system, or waiting on the ATO line, waiting to be answered. Why won't the minister make it easier for such organisations by allowing them to lodge a paper form? I give the call to the Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Financial Services. Uh, thank, I thank uh, the uh, member for Mayo for a question and note that there are 76,000 uh, constituents in her electorate who are getting a pa uh, tax cut this week. Um, Happy to engage with the uh, member on the issue she raises, and I'm sure uh, the Assistant Minister uh, for Charities would also be happy to engage uh, with this, the minister on ways that we can ensure uh, that not-for-profits, charities and not-for-profits, are able to meet their legal obligations, whether it's to tax office to other, or to other um, compliance means as well. I will say that, as a, a general rule, the capacity of members of the public to lodge their tax returns with the tax office uh, through electronic means means they can do it more efficiently and they can do it more effectively and they can get their returns paid far more quickly than they would otherwise be able to do through the lodgement of old paper, of paper returns. Uh, this um, uh, is true in relation to individual taxpayers and it's also true in relation to uh, uh, not-for-profits and other organisations as well. To the specific issues that you raise, uh, the member for Mayor, be happy to engage with you and other members of this House to ensure that we can help uh, not-for-profit and small businesses meet those obligations. Absolutely. Yeah. Good answer. Give the call to the member for Boothby. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Skills and Training. How is the Albanese Labor government skilling a workforce to support a future made in Australia? How does the government's support for apprentices and vocational education and training compare to alternative policy settings? The call to the Minister for Skills and Training. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. Can I thank the uh, member for Boothby for her question? It was great to be with her at uh, Tonsley TAFE, meeting with Fee Free TAFE students pretty recently. Uh, speaker, of all the things that we've learned uh, through the uh, enduring a global pandemic, perhaps the most important was the need to be more self-reliant as a nation, to stand on our own two feet, to build greater sovereign capability. And the Albanese government understands that supporting a future made in Australia is essential to achieving that goal to rebuild our manufacturing sector. Now, of course, those opposite have historically failed to support the manufacturing sector. In fact, we can, in fact we've, a very interesting interjection, because who could forget the former Liberal National Government goading a car company to leave our shores? And that's exactly what happened because of the efforts of the previous Liberal Government. Of course, they have never supported the car industry, and they, decide, they actually said that government should not support the industry, which makes it rather bizarre, uh, makes it rather bizarre Mr Speaker, that it wants to left. tip hundreds of billions of dollars into a risky, expensive, state-owned nuclear reactor situation. That is effectively what the opposition is saying. There wasn't enough. We couldn't support the car industry, but we can actually we can actually invest hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayers' dollars into uh, the nuclear re into nuclear reactors. Well, what a remarkable Order. turnaround by those opposite. Speaker, the fact is we need to invest in areas of demand, and we need to invest in the manufacturing sector. That's why we introduced fee free TAFE. We've had almost, we've had now more than 400,000 Australians enrolled in fee free TAFE Order. in areas of the Definitely. energy sector in the manufacturing the, sector, IT sector and the other. The we need minister, to ensure the, the minister will, we match the minister those skills. Will pause. It applies to everyone across the chamber. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will now leave the chamber under 94A. Uh, minister has one minute remaining. Thanks, Speaker. Well, of course, we saw the previous government's last budget cut support for apprentices, and of course we've actually turned that around and now investing more money to support apprentices and employers in manufacturing, in the housing and construction sector, in the energy sector and other sectors of the economy. And of course, to ensure that we're delivering the best possible skills, we're creating centres of excellence, bringing universities and TAFEs together, working with industry. We announced recently one in Western Australia, another in Canberra, and there's many more to come. Speaker, we're investing in up-to-date uh, equipment in our TAFE campuses and ensuring we increase the teachers and trainers we need to provide the skills pipeline for the energy sector, for the, manage, for the manufacturing sector. Speaker, while those opposite continue to say that fee free TAFE is wasteful spending, while they still have no plan to supply the skills to our economy, we will get on with the job supplying skills to make sure we have a future made in Australia. I call to the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister guarantee that during his Prime Ministership he will not change the current negative gearing and capital gains tax treatment of rental properties? Order the Minister for the Environment. The Prime Minister has the call. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker. Um, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question. He hasn't asked a question about anything that we actually are doing in the housing area. And, and What's more, he hasn't even asked a question about anything that he's doing. <laughs> Be it their, their nuclear reactor policy. Order. <laughs> the Leader of the Opposition on the point of order. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, on relevance, and I seek your ruling as to whether the Prime Minister is in order, because the question was specific. It was tight, didn't ask about alternatives, and all day we've had questions uh, that have been provided that haven't been answered. He hasn't given a straight answer all day, and I, I seek your ruling in relation to whether he is relevant to the question that was asked of him. I just, I just want to refer to the Leader's Radius point of order. On the 17th of June 2000, 2020, Speaker Smith made a ruling regarding 
that the minister or prime minister was entitled to a preamble, a preamble as, re as robust as that was. It was a shorter question than he's had before, so he's had 30 seconds as a preamble. So I'm now going to invite him to address the very specific nature of the question, given that he has had his preamble. Prime thanks, Minister has the call. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. They, they, they really don't want to talk about the policies that they have, uh, which isn't surprising given it's not so much a supermarket policy as a super Marxist the policy. Prime, <laughs> Prime Minister will Mr. return Speaker, to the question. Mr. Speaker, I'm asked about ruling things out. And I'll tell you what I'll rule out, Mr. Speaker. I rule out choosing copper over fibre for the MBN. I rule out governing by colour coded spreadsheets. I rule out paying $30 million for a block of land that's worth three. I rule out having Order. 22 energy policies and not implementing any. The, the Leader of the Opposition has made a point of order on relevance, so it will have to be a different point of order. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, the Prime Minister is defying your ruling, and you issued a very specific instruction, and the Prime Minister has completely and utterly disregarded your direction, and I ask that you direct him back to the question uh, and provide an answer that is coherent. <laughs> order. The Prime Minister was asked about ruling things in and out regarding a topic, so he can't just go around the world about topics that he hasn't been asked about. So he is entitled, if he's asked a question about ruling things in and out, of course he can address the, that part of the question as he is able to, but he will need order, but he will need to refine his remarks to the topic of the question. That's right, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I rule out telling manufacturers to go offshore. We have an alternative plan. One of the things that we do is we state what our policies are. And our policy. Order. And there the he goes, the... Macho Man here. The... He thinks it's all about the testosterone, Mr. Speaker. Order. And wonders, wonders why he has a problem with 51 per cent of the population. Wonders why, Mr. Speaker. Order. Um, we have put forward a coherent $32 billion Home for Australia plan. We have put forward everything. Oh, come on. No. I'm talking about how. The Prime Minister is talking. The Prime Minister is talking about capital gains tax and negative gearing and housing. Talking about housing. Well. Yeah. Order. The Minister for Climate Change and Energy. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, with, with respect, uh, the Prime Minister is demonstrating none to you at the moment. You Order. have given him a direction. He was asked the specific question about not whether he would rule in or out. The question was, does the Prime Minister guarantee that during his Prime Ministership he will not change the current negative gearing and capital gains tax treatment of rental properties? That was the question put. The pre-prepared list that he's got of ruling things Resume. out is not relevant to this question. Resume your seat. Well, it, it, the, the Leader of the Opposition can't order. 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 No, we're just going. We, we just, the, the order. The Leader of the Opposition is in. Is in Wait. The, the Leader of the Opposition has asked his question. He's entitled to ask. No order. He's entitled, but he can't require a specific answer. The Prime Minister has moved off the ruling in and out. He's now talking about the policy topic. I was listening carefully to make sure he's being relevant regarding the issues raised in the question. So he's just going to continue down that line. And if he veers off, I can reassure the Leader of the Opposition we will make sure that we follow the standing orders. And he has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker. He's gone from nuclear to meltdown. <laughs> nuclear to meltdown, which he does consistently, Mr Speaker. I'm asked about negative gearing. Order. And indeed, the member for Menzies had something to say about negative gearing as well when asked. He said this, I'm not going to do the rule in, rule out of particular policies here. That's what he had to say. And then he spoke. No, the, the member for Warden, resume your seat. 
Order. Just about negative the Prime gearing. Minister has asked a question about negative gearing, and he's talking about directly a quote about negative gearing. Of course, that is relevant. Of course, that is relevant. Okay. The, no, I'll hear from the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I want to seek clarity, please. So a question of you. Have you issued a direction? Have you given clarity? And that is, is your ruling that the Prime Minister is in order? Well, I'm dealing with the issue that was raised. So the Prime Minister was asked the question is You're entitled to take a court you're entitled to take a you're entitled to take a course of order. The member for Wannan on a Member for Wannan on a point of order. Yeah, I'd ask the Minister for Environment to withdraw that comment, please. I didn't hear the Minister for the Environment, but uh, to assist the House, if she could assist the House. Of course, to assist you, Mr Speaker, I withdraw. Prime Minister, if you can directly answer the question. Thanks. Sorry, make your answer directly relevant. We are doing everything in our housing policy that we said we would our Homes for Australia plan, $32 billion. That is all we are considering doing. I ask they vote for it. Yeah. Give the call to the member for Aston. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. What action is the Albanese Labor government taking to ensure that Australians have affordable access to life-changing medicines? Why is the government determined to deliver cheaper medicines, and how is this different from other approaches? Give a call to the Minister for Health and Aged Care. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the terrific member for Aston for that question because she knows and is proud of the fact that Australia has one of the best medicine systems in the world, underpinned by the PBS, which is a great Labor legacy that was opposed tooth and nail, just like Medicare, by the Liberal Party when we went to introduce it. The PBS ensures, Mr. Speaker, that Australian patients get access to the best cutting-edge treatments that are developed anywhere in the world at affordable prices. And in just two years in government, Mr Speaker, we've already made more than 200 new or expanded listings on the PBS. This week, for example, we listed a brand new treatment for an extreme form of lupus, an autoimmune disease that causes uh, inflammation and sometimes very serious organ damage. Lupus affects around 20,000 people in Australia, 90 per cent of whom are women. Uh, and the new treatment, Safnello, is the first new treatment for this extreme form of lupus in literally decades. I'm advised it will benefit around 1,400 patients each and every year, and without the listing they'd be paying around $19,000 a year. But we know, Mr Speaker, that even at PBS prices, too many Australians have difficulty still affording the medicines that their doctors have prescribed for them, around a million every year, according to the ABS. And that is why, Mr Speaker, we promised the Australian people that we would make medicines cheaper. And we've spent the last two years being busy delivering on that promise. In just the first three months of government, we slashed the maximum amount that millions of pensioners would pay for their medicines each year by 25 per cent. In the first 12 months, we delivered the biggest cut to the price of medicines in the 75-year history of the PBS. And in the first 18 months, we finally allowed doctors to prescribe common medicines for chronic conditions for 60 days' supply, not just 30 days' supply. Mr. Speaker. And in the May budget just a few weeks ago, we added another measure, which was to freeze the price of PBS medicines for up to five years. That measure alone Mr. Speaker, will save Australian patients as much as half a billion dollars on top of the more than $400 million we have already saved them in just under two years. Mr Speaker, cheaper medicines are obviously good for the hip pocket, but they are also good for people's health. It is just good health policy. But the Leader of the Opposition 
had a very different approach, which I was asked about. And in his first budget as health minister, a horror health budget, he actually tried to make medicines more expensive. He tried to jack up the price of medicines by up to $5 a script. And that is what you get from this guy. You get higher doctor's fees, you get high medicines prices, you get high grocery prices through his shambles of a supermarket policy, and of course you'd get higher power prices through nuclear reactors. Yeah. Call to the Prime Minister. Ask further questions be placed on the notice paper.